Hello everyone this is part 6 of what if Deku married Toga, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to share, and check out the playlist, to see more comment down below, now let's start the, intro. Join my membership the perks are great, it's in the description. Detective Naomasa almost trips when he first steps foot on what may as well be ground zero. Barriers that rival a prison's walls hid the devastation site well from the road, but beyond those gates, it's complete fallout. What must have once been business buildings are now leveled, rubble and wooden heaps or piles that would be enough to turn the zone into a junkyard. A huge gaping hole in the ground grants access to a network of metallic hallways that run beneath it. No doubt, a team has already been dispatched to explore where those tunnels led. However, what Naomasa has to worry about is cleaning up what's on the surface. Waiting for the detective amidst the crime scene is the underground hero that called him here, the pro-hero Sir Naitaye who had been investigating the Yakuza as well, and surprisingly Toshinori with an even more surprising fourth person. The latter is much younger than the others, but a blonde like Toshinori and certainly in the profession of hero work judging by the red cape billowing behind him. Unsure of how long the group has been waiting for him, Naomasa removes his hat to place over his chest in an apologetic gesture. I take it you've all already become acquainted with one another. The detective shoots a glance in Toshinori's direction that meets the blonde's eye. Once the two are locked onto each other, he briefly shifts his gaze to Aizawa, silently asking if he knows that he's all might. Toshinori subtly shakes his head. I don't think you and I have had the pleasure yet. The younger of the bunch steps forward with his hand outstretched. Naomasa returns the gesture and the two shake in greeting. I'm Mirio Togata. He then strikes a pose that practically screams power from the way his muscles flex, Lemelian. I believe you two will be working closely together in the future. Toshinori politely interjects by placing a hand on each of their shoulders. When Naomasa looks into the blue of the number one hero's eyes, he can see the sincerity in that statement. Toshinori's smile is so soft and tender that it looks sheepish. Being a detective, Naomasa reads between the lines. He realizes just who Togata is, that he truly does represent the younger generation of heroes. Seeing Sir Naitaye present all but confirms it. Naomasa smiles, his a sweet sorrowful softness, equally as tender like a fresh cut. I'm sure we will. He acknowledges Lemelian as All Might's successor in that moment with a bittersweet acceptance. We're working together right now, Aizawa deadpans with a sense of dry humor. He sizes Toshinori up and down with his eyes, skeptical of the blonde's presence. Remembering him from Naitai's office, he holds his tongue for the time being. The underground hero is too tired to solve another mystery, so he sighs in surrender before relenting, I'm still not sure how you factor into all of this, but if Naitaye and Detective Scouchy vouch for you, then feel free to listen in. Naomasa can't decide between wanting to roll his eyes at Aizawa's antics or laughing. The detective can only imagine what the tired underground hero would come up with if he only knew about All Might and One for All. With how far-fetched Aizawa's theories usually are, it'd be amusing and entertaining for once. Aizawa glances around the circle of people that's gathered before beginning, this was the last known stronghold used by the Yakuza. They were a dying population, an endangered species if you will, and now they've been wiped out in the blink of an eye. Cross-referencing my reports, the number of stakeouts, sting operations, and all else my agency has done to catch the Yakuza with their hand in the cookie jar. Aizawa is 100% correct, so Naitaye continues for the underground hero. He smooths out his combed green hair before elaborating, all bodies, despite the disfigurement, have been identified. The entire Yakuza is present and accounted for. Toshinori grits his teeth in frustration, his usual smile vanishing. When the hero gets passionate about something, he has a hard time keeping that righteous rage in check. The blonde's fists tremble at his sides as he applies pressure to clench them tight, it shouldn't have gone like this. So gruesome, Togata surveys the crime scene with an equally troubled expression. He seems as though he's only now noticed the corpses. It's not heroic at all is all he has to say about the way the Yakuza was mangled. Naomasa sees why Toshinori chose the boy now. There's a bit of himself in his successor. They both agree that the Yakuza should have been brought down by heroes and the police. That villains and criminals alike should be defeated by the law. 
their view of justice is the same. Naomasa is sure Toshinori chose correctly. He nods his head in humble agreement with their sentiments and his friend's decision for a successor. Naitie hums in mutual consensus before continuing, while this ends the chapter on the Yakuza, it doesn't quite close the book, his calculating gaze shifts to Naomasa, as feared, this ties directly into your investigation on the Tokyo Ghoul. The detective is startled by suddenly being made the center of attention. Under the gaze of Naitie no less, whether that stare is with his foresight quirk activated or not, it's unsettling. Naomasa does his own surveillance of the crime scene before responding. Though he'd already seen it all on the way in, he really takes in the amount of destruction. This time, he thinks about it rather than just looking. How do we know this was the ghoul? While the bodies are his MO, this wreckage isn't, he inquires the group to see if they managed to gather any concrete evidence yet. Of course, Izawa is the one to speak on behalf of them when it comes to this part. This wreckage is from a rampage. Based on my theory that the ghoul is a preteen or a teenager, a temper tantrum isn't far-fetched, and it's of course all based merely on speculation. That's an assumption, Izawa. We've been over this, Naomasa refrains from slapping his palm too hard into his face. He swears he feels wrinkles starting to come in at this point. However, Naitie is quick to defend a razorhead. What's not an assumption is that the Yakuza was holding a child here. Once that child went missing, this happened, he prevents his glasses from sliding any further down his nose by pushing him up, that can't be a coincidence. Not you too, Naomasa winces in sympathy for Toshinori's former sidekick. He knows what it's like to be roped into Aizawa's crazy conspiracies and to actually start believing them. Trying to remain the voice of reason, he persists, that still doesn't mean it was all the ghoul. Aizawa crosses his arms over his chest before asking with a raised brow, weren't you the one who originally suspected the ghoul was involved with the Yakuza? Naomasa opens his mouth to deny the claim, but remembers asking that question when Aizawa first contacted him about the Yakuza resurfacing. That's only because I didn't expect you to call me for any other reason, he says as an excuse more for himself than the team that's assembled. When he sees none of them are convinced, he goes for a different approach, look. I'm trying to be optimistic here. We don't want this to be ghoul related. It's almost like you're hoping this is the ghoul's work. I am hopeful, Izawa admits. All heads turn towards the underground hero, surprised by his statement. Naomasa wonders if all that sleep deprivation and caffeine finally destroyed his mind. That's until he explains himself, if it is, then we have another lead towards catching them. The ghoul has never acted on impulse this emotionally before. I told you, there's people influencing their actions now. As much sense as that reasoning makes, Toshinori shakes his head. I'm with Naomasa. We don't want this to be the ghoul. That remark doesn't help better Aizawa's opinion of the blonde judging by the frown he wears. Toshinori sees the expression and returns it with his own, not backing down. He explains himself like Aizawa had to for everyone to understand, if they're just a child, then we want them to be rehabilitated. Going from robbing blood banks to this is a big leap in the wrong direction. Naitie massages his chin as he mulls over both sides of the argument, stroking a non-existent beard of wisdom. When he can't decide which one he agrees with, he shifts his focus back to Toshinori. After all that the ghoul has done, you think they can still be rehabilitated? It's a valid question that he directs at the symbol of peace. Except, it's that symbol's successor that answers. Anyone can be saved. His smile is a radiant ray of hope brighter than the sun. Toshinori's smile is much more reserved, but noticeable when Togata adds, that's the job of a hero. Aizawa takes interest in the younger hero and directs his own questions towards him. What if they can't help themselves? What if it's more than blood? What if they can only eat flesh? But his tone sounds like genuine concern and not some sort of counter-argument. Taking pity on the poor boy so that he doesn't fall under Aizawa's wrath, and having had enough of the group's bickering, Naomasa decides to intervene. We'll cross those bridges when we get there. Right now, we need to focus on actually finding the ghoul, he glances from member to member of the ragtag team, that's why we're all meeting, right? Yes. Naitie nods, this has become a group effort. We all need to report to one another if this is to work. Aizawa faces Naitie to tack on, we should break into teams. We'll accomplish more that way. Since the Yakuza was yours to begin with, you can follow this rabbit hole to see if it goes anywhere. 
but Naomasa doesn't want to let the underground hero become team captain if he can help it. The detective pulls way too many all-nighters as it is. And what about you? He asks Izawa to see if he can trip him up. Considering a razor head doesn't smile often, and his grin is nowhere near as bright or assuring as Togators or Toshinori's, the shivers that run down the detective's spine are to be expected. Don't worry, Scouchy, I'm not off the hook either. As a matter of fact, you're with me, Izawa says with a toothy smirk. What? Why? Naomasa grabs his head in bewilderment. He has no hat to scrunch, only hair to pull. He just might yank it all out. We've still got the mask shop to investigate. It's been long enough that you got that search warrant we talked about, right? Izawa reverts to his usual all business and no pleasure demeanor to remind the detective of their previous arrangement. Remembering that tie to the Yakuza and potential lead on the ghoul, Naomasa nods, yeah. Then it's settled. Izawa concludes the meeting by starting to break away from the small huddle. Before he can walk too far away though, Toshinori catches him by the shoulder. When Izawa looks back, what about us? The deflated hero gestures between himself and Togator. Izawa's shrug knocks the blonde's hand off his shoulder. You tell me, he dismisses the two before resuming his walk towards the exit. When the blonde turns around to ask the others for their input, Naomasa shrugs too. Sorry, Toshinori. I always hate to admit it, but when Izawa is right, he's right. The detective deflates just as much as the frail form of the hero once he makes that confession. Seeing nobody else has a task for them, Naitei offers a solution to the pair of blondes. The best you two can do is patrol this general vicinity and hope the ghoul keeps a small hunting ground, before waving for them to leave too. Yeah. Toshinori sighs as he follows behind the retreating form of Izawa, we can only hope. Little does the hero know, the Tokyo ghoul actually is nearby. Working his regular shift at Anteiku, Akatani Mikumo serves coffee to customers while occasionally taking a sip from his own cup. Meanwhile, Eri sits at her usual table waiting for him to finish working. The little girl looks up from her coloring book to see a boy sitting at the table across from her. He has evenly split peppermint hair and a burn scar that reaches from his hairline to the bottom half of his cheek. What interests her the most about the customer, however, is what he's holding in his hands. Eri is startled by surprise when the boy looks up from the novel that he's reading. Heterochromic eyes squint when they meet the horned girls. Yes, the boy tilts his head as he tries to gauge the child that's been staring at him. S sorry, Eri squeaks out as she shrinks in on herself to the size of a mouse. Past traumatic experience has her recalling the punishments she would get from the Yakuza. She glances in the direction of Akatani, knowing that he'd protect her. Yet, she can't help but be afraid of what the scarred boy might do to her. Recognizing the small girl's body language all too well, the boy softens his glare. There's no reason to apologize, he says as an attempt to put her at ease. When Eri looks back up, having not expected that from him, he tries to follow her eyeline. He's not usually self-conscious about it, but he has a feeling he knows just why a child would take interest in his appearance as well as be afraid of him. Were you staring at my scar? He asks. Eri's eyes widen with her mouth, a panicked realization dawning on her. And no, she exclaims to clear up the misunderstanding. Her eyes fall on the book in the boy's hands. I just. My brother is reading me that book. Her voice wobbles a bit but she works up enough courage to give an explanation. Realizing he jumped to conclusions, the boy's own eyes widen a bit. He too looks down at the novel he's holding. He doesn't think the little girl in front of him is the right reading age for it, but he isn't the best at estimating how old somebody is either. He's fairly certain the girl is no older than 10 though. Unfamiliar with how to interact with kids, he's a little more awkward than usual when he says, oh. Yes, it's very good. Relief relaxing her expression, Eri perks up a little. MHM? She nods in agreement, I don't understand some of the words sometimes, but Big Bro teaches me what they mean. The boy nods too, pleased that he was right in the assumption that she wouldn't be able to read a book of that level. That's nice, he's uncertain of how to reply though. He's not used to being social, let alone with a kid. Scrambling for a way to break the awkward silence, he finds another common ground, I have older siblings too. That must have been the right thing to say, since Eri's mouth hangs open in awe. Her eyes shimmer under the sunbeams that shoot through the window. 
Are they as nice as a car to me? The interest she has to hear his answer has her leaning forward in her chair. A faint trace of a smile crosses the boy's lips. He wants to laugh at the nickname the little girl gave her brother, but refrains from it as to not upset her. Yes, they are. His smile softens as he speaks with fondness, especially my sister. I have a big sis too. Eri bounces with joy in her seat. She radiates with happiness over being able to relate with the boy in so many ways. The coloring book she has just so happened to be one that Himiko herself doodled in. The blood red crayon colored heart that the blonde drew makes Eri say, she's nice like a car to knee, but silly. Familiar with the concept of siblings, the boy can't withhold a small chuckle this time. My sister is silly too, he says while recalling the occasions that his sister would try to cheer him up. Taking a moment to pause his work of taking orders, Akatani checks on Eri with a glance. When he sees his younger sister talking to some random guy, his instinct to protect her kicks in. Eri, are you all right? The brotherly barista is at her table in a flash. He looks her over for injuries, not finding anything, but only lessens his concern when she nods in confirmation that she isn't harmed. Akatani then remembers where he's at and feigns being apologetic to the customer, I'm so sorry, sir. She's usually too shy to do this sort of thing. She was no trouble. The boy waves dismissively before extending that same hand, you must be a car to knee. Taken aback by the customer's usage of Eri's nickname, he stumbles over himself a bit before being able to shake hands. Ah, I it's actually a Akatani, he stammers with a small blush of embarrassment. The boy's small smile returns when he sees the red dusting the barista's cheeks. I like a car to knee better, he shrugs his shoulders as he teases Akatani. Seeing Akatani's blush turn even brighter, Eri tilts her head in curiosity. Glancing between the two boys, she innocently asks a not-so-innocent question, is this like when you and Big Sis flirt? The boy with peppermint hair raises a brow, sending Akatani into a full spiral. It's not like that, he blurts out in an attempt to avoid a miscommunication, H her, Big Sis, isn't actually blood-related. After trying to salvage the situation, Akatani mumbles under his breath, I shouldn't have told her what flirting is. The customer's smile stretches as he watches Akatani murmur. He finds it amusing how easily flustered the waiter gets. I'm Shoto, he interrupts the panicked jumble of words. Akatani pauses, not quite catching what was said during his mutter frenzy. Ha, huh, he blinks. My name? Shoto explains before reintroducing himself properly, I'm Shoto Todoroki. Being a former hero fanatic and closet otaku, Akatani jumps at the recognition of the boy's family name. Todoroki. Like the number two hero Endeavor Todoroki, he shouts in a moment of euphoria over meeting the number two hero's son. Shoto's smile drops at the mention of Endeavor. Yes. Akatani flinches at the cold bite of the boy's tone. Can we not talk about my father though? Just now noticing the burn mark on Shoto's face, Akatani comes to his own assumed conclusions. Oh. He bows apologetically for having been insensitive, I'm sorry. Shoto feels the other boy's eyes on his scar. Placing a hand over the permanent burn, he sighs and clears up any misplaced thoughts, he wasn't the one that did this if that's what you're thinking. Shoto can see surprise mixed with confusion cross Akatani's face before his expression becomes something more relieved. What Shoto says next wipes that relieved expression away, it was my mother's doing. She hated my quirk. Shoto turns his head, no longer looking at Akatani directly. Um. Akatani swallows whatever condolences he could have given. He's sure Todoroki has heard all of it before and that those words are just empty without meaning by now. Looking at Eri, Akatani instead comes up with a potential solution to the burn victim's shame. I know we just met and this might be presumptuous of me, but Eri and I get ridiculed for our quirks too, Shoto's head shoots up in surprise and he finds himself staring at the pair of illegitimate adoptive siblings again, so we actually attend this quirk support group. Maybe you would like to come with us. Staring at the two who claim to be brother and sister, Shoto can't find any physical similarities between the two. One's hair is a pure silky white while the other's is a charcoal black. Yet, he can still see the bond that they share. For two people who get ridiculed for their quirks, they exude an attitude that Shoto can't say he's familiar with. In the short span of time that he's met them, they made him smile more than he has during the past year. Unable to turn down the offer of such good people, Shoto says. I would like that. 
the unlikely trio of Todoroki, Mikumo, and Eri stride in a synchronous step. Their line creates an unintentional wall of tallest to shortest. Yet, none of them notice. Eri at the tail end clings to Akatani's hand like a lifeline, her tiny palm only managing to grab a few fingers in its small size. Todoroki keeps his heterochromic gaze forward while the other boy looks at him from the side. Despite Todoroki's lack of making eye contact or at least glancing in Akatani's direction, the two carry a conversation seemingly well. Both boys overcome their shy by nature attitude for the most part. It's not like they've ascended from introvert to extrovert though. There's still plenty of awkward or curt responses from Todoroki in particular for example. A few of which gained giggles from Eri. The three youths journey down a corridor, heading for the Quirk support group meeting at the end of the hall. Wow, I always dreamed of going to UA. What's it like? Akatani is only now getting over the initial stupor of learning Todoroki is attending Japan's top hero school. Todoroki shrugs as though it's no big deal, treating it just, like any other school. Akatani would be inclined to disagree, and he's not the only one. Not if you're in the hero course, Shinso overhears them as they draw near the building's vending machines. The snack station has become the usual meeting place due to their mutual love for coffee. Akatani waves with his free hand, smiling despite the lazy look Shinso gives the group of three. Shinso, I was wondering if you were gonna be here today, though Akatani was admittedly hoping that the other boy would be so that he could introduce him to Todoroki, this is. I know who he is, Shinso's eyes stop drooping so that they can squint at the hero in training who had tagged along. Todoroki returns the glare with one of his own, also noting the bitterness of Shinso's tone. The effort it takes to scowl with how heavy his eye bags are must be too much, because Shinso lets it drop first. However, not without asking first, what somebody with a privileged quirk like is doing here. Akatani's own eyes widen in shock at how harsh Shinso is being. Come on, that's not fair, he tries to step in between the two but Todoroki moves forward first. That's okay, Mikumo, I know when I'm not welcomed. He continues to direct his glare at Shinso despite addressing Akatani. Akatani makes sure that he gets in between them this time, letting go of Eri so that he can wave both hands in a placating manner. I'm sure that's not what Shinso meant, he forces a fake chuckle in an attempt to de-escalate the situation. Don't speak for me, I meant what I said. Shinso snaps at Akatani next before returning his anger back to Todoroki, he was blessed with a quirk meant for heroics, and yet he wants to come here to complain. Todoroki smirks mirthlessly, a scoff making him sound arrogant to the insomniac. When he raises his left hand to waist level, a few sparks of flame flicker from it. The power display reminds Akatani of someone he knew in his former life. Todoroki incredulously repeats, a blessing. Don't act like the son of Endeavor would be born with a curse. Shinso sneers as he too looks at the side of Todoroki that's able to produce fire. Todoroki's glare flicks forward from his hand, staring at the other boy with animosity. Some of us aren't the children of pro heroes, the outstretched hand folds into a fist when Shinso voices his mutual disdain. Before Akatani can try intervening again, he feels something small grab onto the leg of his pants. A cartony, he sees Eri looking up at him with a worrisome expression, why are they yelling? Taking one of her hands in one of his again to comfort her, he says, it's okay, Eri. There's nothing to be worried about. Her gaze moves from him back to the other teenagers, unconvinced. Akatani sighs before raising his voice towards them, come on, guys. You're scaring Eri. The two stop their bickering to glance over at him and the horned little girl, surprised by the aggressiveness in his tone. Realizing he was perhaps too hostile with how he sounded, he dials it back down with a small plea of, can't we just get along? Shinso opens his mouth as though he's about to retort, pauses, and then frowns. Shaking his head in surrender, he turns his back to the group. I'm going to grab a seat before they're all taken. He doesn't bother glancing back as he uses his excuse to walk away from them. Todoroki watches with Akatani, both boys wondering whether or not one of them should try calling out or going after him. Figuring he doesn't know Shinso well enough, Todoroki resigns himself to defeat as well, I shouldn't have come. He turns to walk in the opposite direction while apologizing to Akatani, sorry for causing a disturbance. No, stay. But Akatani won't let another one of his friends walk out on him, he grabs Todoroki by the shoulder in order to stop him in his tracks. 
Todoroki is surprised by the strength in the boy's grip, but doesn't say nor show any signs of it aside from a glance back. I don't know what got into Shinso, but, Akatani lets his hand slip from Todoroki's shoulder as he suggests, this is a place for sharing. If you're comfortable, maybe you can make him understand how you feel. Todoroki refrains from expressing his internal contemplation, only holding his stare with the other boy. It's as though he'd been frozen in place by the very implication of sharing his feelings. It's as though he'd been asked to tread on thin ice. Have you or Eri ever told anyone how you feel? He asks to see if they'd taken that confident chance yet. Akatani's mouth forms a thin line, unable to say he has. He places a hand on Eri's head, looking down at the little girl. I think if others show that it's okay to be open about it, that then she'll open up too. It's a subtle way of saying he's mostly here for her and not himself. Having siblings of his own, Todoroki can empathize to a certain extent. He sighs before giving a single nod of agreement, fine. I'll give it a try. More relieved than surprised to hear it, Akatani perks up with a shout of, great. He's about to lead the charge straight into the meeting before he realizes the other reason why they stopped by the snack station. Oh, let me just grab a coffee first, he digs into his pocket for his wallet to buy one from the vending machines while asking, you want anything, Eri? When the little girl shakes her head, he turns his towards the other boy, Todoroki. We just came from a coffee shop. Todoroki deadpans with the monotone demeanor that Akatani had been more used to than the exchange between he and Shinso. Oh, I guess we did. Akatani remembers that they did indeed come here from Anteiku while bashfully running a hand through his hair. He then chuckles nervously while trying to cover for himself with the usual excuse he's become accustomed to giving people, my quirk actually makes me have to consume a certain amount of coffee though, so. Oh is the only way Todoroki knows how to respond to that. Though there's no actual genuine shock in his voice nor face. When a canned coffee rolls out upon purchase, Akatani grabs it with a disappointed downward sag of his shoulders. Ah, they've only got heated left, he was hoping to get one of the iced coffees but they're all sold out. Todoroki holds out his right hand, prompting Akatani to hand him the can, let me see. Akatani raises an eyebrow in confusion, but curiously passes it over. Almost instantaneously, Frost flakes the metal as Todoroki cools the coffee down using his right side. Whoa! Akatani exclaims in awe at the display of power. After seeing Todoroki create fire, he wasn't expecting to see ice as well. Is that your quirk? His astonishment becomes mistaken for wonderment when he asks a question that he already knows the answer to by this point. Todoroki nods as he returns the chilled coffee to Akatani. A somber smile so small that it's easily missed forms from his mouth as he explains half-heartedly, my mother's side. Akatani s his head to the side in confusion as he pops open the lid to his coffee. What do you mean? He asks before taking a sip. Todoroki's smile turns downwards, much more noticeable, as he says, the other half is my father's quirk. Akatani picks up on the boy's peculiar wording, swallowing his current gulp of coffee. Your father's, but before he can try to figure out what Todoroki means. We're beginning, a shout comes from the meeting room of the Quirk support group. Todoroki turns in the direction of which the voice came, planning on following it to its source to avoid discussing his Quirk any further. We should go, we wouldn't want to be late, he says as an excuse to drop the topic and walk away. Akatani looks down, planning on being downtrodden, but finds his illegitimate sister staring up at him instead. Not wanting to upset her more than the entire encounter just then may already have, he offers her an assuring smile as best as he can muster before taking her hands in his in order to lead her to the support group's makeshift circle of chairs. Thank you all for coming. An orange-skinned woman the size of the chair she's in welcomes everyone with a toothless smile. She flashes her gums towards Todoroki in what's meant to be a kind gesture, I see we have a new face in the crowd, before turning her gaze to everyone else, remember, all are welcome. Everyone is free to listen or share. None of us have the right to judge the other. Akatani catches Shinso staring at Todoroki, but the purple-haired boy quickly looks away. So no pressure, newbie. Take it at your own pace, the ringleader then finishes her opening statement. Todoroki glances at Akatani, remembering his agreement to speak. Shinso returns his gaze to the newcomer when he says, I don't mind sharing. Oh ho, brave one, the ringleader praises Todoroki with a tiny applause of encouragement. 
I sure as hell couldn't share during my first time. An older man with five sets of eyes that each wears glasses chimes in as well. The man next to him folds his arms before grumbling, first time. Mikumo and Shinso haven't shared still. Todoroki hums as he looks over at Akatani. Both he and Shinso have their heads down, not wanting the unwarranted attention. Will you if I do? Todoroki asks anyways. The entire room goes silent in anticipation, not wanting to miss hearing the answer. Akatani doesn't have to lift his head to see Todoroki is still staring at him. Even Shinso from across the room has an expectant look. Akatani turns his head to see Eri beaming up at him, clearly agreeing with everyone that she'd like to hear him share. Maybe a little, he mumbles. That must be good enough for Todoroki. He responds, okay, before readdressing the entire room to begin his sharing, are you all aware of what quirk marriages are? Meanwhile, someone else is going to have answers unwillingly pried out of them in the interrogation room of a police precinct. Uta, the mask maker, sits in a rickety chair waiting for someone to sit in the replica across the table in front of him. His own reflection in a one-way mirror is all the company he has for now. Eventually, Detective Naomasa enters the room through a steel door. It only opens from the outside, latches locking thanks to a mechanism on the other end when it closes behind him. Sorry to keep you waiting. The detective removes his tan overcoat to hang on the backrest of his chair before sitting down. Uta narrows his eyes at the detective's rectangular ones. I thought you didn't suspect me for anything. He recalls their first meeting and compares it with where he is now. Is there a reason for us to suspect you? Naomasa sounds nonchalant but the question is anything but casual. He's hoping his lie detecting quirk will be able to catch Uta right away, hook, line, and sinker. Uta tugs on the handcuffs attached to his wrist. The other end is attached to a table leg, no second arm to connect her instead. There's a reason why you arrested me. He tries to hide his annoyance but it's evident in his tone. We took you into police custody. This isn't exactly a formal arrest. Naomasa notes the difference for the record. He knows it's safe to add, although it can be, to apply an intimidating pressure for the interrogation though. Like there's a difference. Uta mutters under his breath before asking louder for Naomasa to hear, why am I here? Rather than beat around the bush any longer, Naomasa places a burlap sack on the table. It's not just any old potato sack though. It has eye holes and a mouth schooling. That search warrant I came back to your store with helped us find this. Naomasa gestures to the mask before prompting Uta to elaborate, care to explain. Uta swallows the lump forming in his throat. He recognizes what he made for Soramitsu Tabe right away. Except, he also believes there's no evidence that would determine that's who it belongs to. It's a mask. I run a mask shop. Hardly anything incriminating. He tries to act unfaced by it. While Uta's poker face is good, Naomasa isn't willing to give up so easily. He leans back in his chair with a sigh, prepared for the long haul if that's what it takes to get answers. I'm only about to tell you this because it's a legal requirement per interrogation. He hopes that the revelation of his quirk will work in his favor and not against him as he says, my quirk allows me to detect whether or not you are lying. A lie is considered an admission of guilt, so I suggest cooperating. When Uta's eyes broaden, Naomasa takes that as a sign to begin, since that can only mean he understands. Did you sell to the Yakuza? The detective starts with a simple question first. Uta hesitates, not wanting to answer but knowing there's no use in being uncooperative or lying. So he relents and answers truthfully. Yes. Naomasa nods when his quirk lets him know that Uta wasn't lying. That was a test, he says since he already knew about the mask maker supplying the Yakuza. He returns to the particular mask sold and in his current possession, jabbing it with a finger, this next question is important. Why were you in possession of the mask here? Uta grits his teeth, not quite bearing them like fangs, but definitely being backed into a corner. He knows exactly who returned the mask to him. He won't so easily give a name though. S someone brought it back to the shop, is what he says instead as an attempt to mislead the detective. Naomasa refrains from grinding his own teeth together in mutual frustration. Instead, he continues to pry Uta's mouth open for answers by asking for more specific details, for repairs. No, Uta shoots the question down easily since his answer is true. But that just provides Naomasa with a window of opportunity to dig a little deeper. 
He knows Uta has something to hide if he's trying to prolong the process this much. Who brought it to you? Was it the Yakuza? He feels like he already knows the answer but asks regardless. Uta avoids the first question entirely, opting for the second. No, it wasn't the Yakuza, and the answer he gives is exactly what Naomasa was expecting. Considering they both already knew the Yakuza were buying from him, it wouldn't have been an admission of any kind of guilt to say they just brought one of the masks back. Which means whoever had the mask wasn't a member of the Yakuza. Considering the Shi Hasaikai was massacred, Naomasa suspects that the person in question must be the one responsible for it. Regardless of whether that's the ghoul like Aiza were suspects or not, it'll be a huge break in the investigation to discover their Adini. I see. Naomasa nods as he comes to terms with his own deductive reasoning. Wanting to broach that possibility, he tries asking, are you aware that the Yakuza has been completely wiped out? An unreadable reaction comes from Uta. He's unable to remain stoic anymore, mouth as wide as his eyes. Naomasa almost mistakens it for complete and total surprise, prepared to dismiss his prior theory, but then notices the shakiness of Uta's single hand. The chain of the handcuffs rattles. I, I don't know what to say, Uta truly is shaken to the core. Not because he cares about the Yakuza though, and not quite because he wasn't expecting the demise either. To Naomasa, it looks more like an expression of awe over something finally happening. Perhaps there were no expectations, but something else. A possibility. A chance. He knew that it could maybe happen. I'll take that as a yes. Naomasa keeps his eyes on Uta as he searches for any other nonverbal responses. When he finds none, he tries to be more direct. Answer me this. Do you know who did it? Uta's eyes begin to water. He's holding back tears, trying to shake him away with his head. I I do, he hates himself for admitting that to the detective. Naomasa leans forward in his seat. He's sure that the underground hero watching the interrogation from the other side of the one-way mirror is leaning forward in anticipation too. Was it the Tokyo ghoul? The detective's voice trembles as much as Uta himself. Uta's body is racked with sobs as he gives in to the tears. Please. He cries out to anyone that'll hear his begging. The detective. God. Even though he's looking down at the floor from which the devil dwells. Uta knows he'll be going there, for how can God forgive him when he can't forgive himself? Akatani on the other hand. Uta wipes the tears from his eyes so that he can look Naomasa in his, he's just a kid. He doesn't know any better. Shinso's shoulders sag similarly to the skin under his eyes as he listens to Todoroki's tale of woe. A few winces and grimaces wash over the group in waves when they hear about the abuse. Some relate, rubbing bruises of their own. It's something none of them expected to hear. Akatani sneaks a glance at Eri, reminded of the girl's time spent with the Yakuza. The bandages she used to wear and what was underneath haunts him just as much as it must her. My father used my mother to get his masterpiece of a quirk. Todoroki summarizes the story as he creates a flame in the palm of one hand while emitting frost from the other to demonstrate. The scarred boy no longer sounds resentful. Just sad. Even when he says, that's why I despise his side. Shinso continues staring at Todoroki. As though he's studying him. The son of Endeavor stares at his open palms with such dismay that he'd have you believe they're covered in blood. Akatani knows what that's like. To look at your hands, yourself, and see something horrendous. Todoroki's hands don't appear dirty to the group, but he clearly sees something on them that they don't. Todoroki only breaks from the inner turmoil when Shinso causes a disruption. The chair legs scraping against the floor when Shinso stands up draws everyone's attention. Just as abruptly as he stood, Shinso turns and leaves. After a moment of awkward silence, nobody knowing whether they should go to or what to say if they choose to stay, the group leader clears her throat. Redrawing everyone's attention, the orange-skinned woman offers a sympathetic smile. Thank you for sharing. That was very brave of you. The group collectively nods in agreement with her sentiment. Akatani turns to the other boy, carefully placing a hand on his shoulder to apply a tender touch. The scarred boy isn't being responsive to any of it. He's looking past them all, beyond Akatani, he's staring in the direction that Shinso went. Todoroki, Akatani gently prods, how do you feel? Hearing the other boy, Todoroki seems to slightly pull out of it. Better, he's lacking the confidence behind that answer though, his uncertainty comes through even more when he adds, I think. 
Seeing Akatani and the others concerned for his well-being, he offers them a tiny smile of assurement. It was nice to say it all out loud. However, his heterochromic eyes keep glancing in the direction that Shinso left from, having Akatani believe that's who Todoroki wanted to hear it most. Looking in that same direction, Akatani asks, do you want to step out of the room for a bit? Todoroki finally breaks his gaze from the exit to look at Akatani. He sees the other boy, following the outstretched arm to his shoulder. Sure. Todoroki nods to show his appreciation before standing up, I think I would. Akatani takes Eri's hand in his while waving goodbye to the support group with the other, thanks everyone. The small crowd reciprocates the gesture before he follows Todoroki's tracks. You ready to go, or do you want to go back later? Akatani asks Eri as they leave so that she doesn't feel left out. The little girl shrugs, indifferent to the decision. When the trio go through the exit and enter the hall, all three are surprised to a sudden stop. None of them expected to find none other than Shinso waiting for them there. The purple-headed boy has his hands in his pockets before taking them out to place at his sides in order to bow. I'm sorry, he apologizes while facing Todoroki in particular, I was narrow-minded. I thought being born with a quirk not useful for heroics was the only reason someone could be burdened. Raising his back, but not his head, he continues, I didn't realize that there was more to it than that. The glazed look Todoroki had moistens. For a fleeting moment, he just might have cried. It's okay, he gestures for Shinso to raise his head, I forgive you. Akatani refrains from breathing a sigh of relief beside him. Shinso doesn't lift his head just yet though. He's not done apologizing. I know it's no excuse, but it's just that. His dampened eyes tightly clamp shut in frustration, I applied for you a too. That shocks both Todoroki and Akatani. Neither of them expected to hear any of this. Finally lifting his head, Shinso opens his eyes again. I took the entrance exam and failed because my quirk wasn't suited for the test. His voice is distantly reflective as he explains, I'm in gen ed now, but I so badly wanted to be a hero. Shinso, Akatani can't help but empathize despite not having taken a hero school's entrance exam himself. He at least knows what it's like to have the dream of becoming a hero ripped away due to the quirk you're born with. It's a sensitive subject, so he tries to be as gentle as he can when prompting Shinso to share some more, what is your quirk, if you don't mind me asking. The insomniac averts his gaze, fixing it to the floor. The silent response from Shinso almost makes Akatani backpedal. However, the quiet pause doesn't go on for long enough to reach that point. Rather, Shinso pushes past his hesitance enough to ask in a tired tone, are you sure you want to know? Akatani is a tad reluctant himself, not wanting to pressure Shinso into feeling like he has to answer. Taking a glance towards Todoroki and Eri to see what they think, their each is equally ambivalent. Shinso waits patiently, expecting a response. Akatani opens his mouth to answer, ye, but finds himself stopping short. Not of his own accord though. It's more like someone else seized control of his voice, silencing him. Akatani finds it hard to speak. He finds it difficult to convey his thoughts. It's like he no longer has any say over himself. Shinso then shows him who does have a say. Nod your head if you're under my control. Akatani feels his head bobbing up and down despite the order not coming from his own mind. Then, after doing as he was commanded, he's freed. Akatani feels in control of his own motor functions again, testing them by opening and closing his mouth or flexing his fingers. My quirk is called brainwashing. Shinso explains what exactly just happened to him. Eri and Todoroki stare at Akatani in wonderment as he comprehends the ability that just allowed Shinso to possess him. Whoa. Akatani feels like a puppet that's just had its string cut as he rolls his shoulders. Your quirk is villainous. Shinso cuts him off, I know. Akatani fervently shakes his head in denial, not at all, catching Shinso by surprise. It's amazing, but that makes the boy with bedhead a double take, it's super suited for hero work, especially if you were to go underground so nobody could see it coming. Todoroki is a stark contrast of passive standing next to Akatani's exuberance. Yet, he agrees with the other boy's sentiment nonetheless. It's plenty powerful enough. If you were to brainwash me before I could encase you in ice, then my quirk would be rendered useless by comparison, he says while Akatani nods along. It's super cool, Shinso, Akatani reassures the brainwasher before turning to the girl holding his hand, 
right, Eri. Eri shyly mimics Akatani's earlier nod before joining in with her own praise, why you could have told the bad men to stop hurting me. However, she unknowingly alters the mood with her input. Both Todoroki and Shinso shift their posture while looking at Akatani for answers. Bad men, Shinso hardens his gaze. Todoroki does the same, stepping closer to Eri. Ah, that's, Akatani stammers as he scrambles for an explanation. He wasn't expecting to be put on the spot and it's not like he can exactly tell the truth that he massacred the Yakuza to free her. It's a long story, he forces himself to laugh in a poor attempt to lighten the mood. When there's no change in the other boy's aura, he scratches the back of his head to try and jumpstart his brain for an excuse. Fortunately for him, Eri comes to his rescue. Akatani saved me though, so it's okay now, she says while gazing up at the boy who's serving as her older brother. It's evident in her expression that she's shifted her admiration from Shinso back to him. Shinso and Todoroki visibly relax knowing he had nothing to do with the so-called, bad men. Akatani does as well, relieved that they're relieved. He gives Eri's hand a soft squeeze and a small smile. Shinso runs a hand through his unruly head of purple hair, if you two weren't already mysterious enough, exasperated by the entire exchange. While Shinso finds them to be exhausting, Todoroki finds himself being further intrigued by the sibling-like duo. That reminds me, he shifts his gaze to Akatani in hopes of seeing something more, Mikumo. You promised to share if I did. Having completely forgotten his promise, all Akatani can manage at first is a fragile, oh. Feeling his grip slacken, Eri's gaze up at him becomes one laced with concern. Shinso also notes the way his demeanor shifted. I guess you're right. I did say that, didn't I? His voice being so timidly quiet makes Todoroki tilt his head in confusion. Shinso steps forward, you don't have to if you aren't comfortable, hoping to help. But Akatani shakes his head to let him know that he's okay. No, no, you two confided in me. It's only fair that I tell you my quirk too. His confidence is low as he avoids making eye contact, but... Shinso, when he turns his gaze back up, his eyes look more fatigued than the insomniacs. If anyone's quirk here is villainous, the hand that's not holding Eri's grabs the fabric of the shirt that's covering his heart, it's mine. Eri isn't the type to make an outburst, so nobody expects her to interject with an emotional shout. That's not true, she tugs on Akatani's arm as if that'll shake some sense into him, you saved me and you said heroes save people, so you can't be a villain. Akatani manages a fond but sad smile as he picks up Eri. She clings to him even tighter now that she can hug his body. There's a reason that I didn't try for you eh though, he says to the floor now that he's staring down at the empty space where Eri once was. When he says the rest, it's said facing towards Todoroki, my quirk is powerful too. Except, it's too powerful. He holds Eri a little closer as he recalls what it can do, I can hurt people with it, he rephrases that when he remembers how he managed to keep her, I have hurt people with it. Shinso shifts uncomfortably as he says, why you still haven't told us what it is yet. Akatani sighs when he finds no words to explain it any more than he already has. He figures it'll be easier if he just shows them. So he closes his eyes, covers them with the hand that's not carrying Eri, and lets the ghoul peer through the cage of his mind's eye. When he slides his hand back, it pulls the hair hanging over his one eye to expose both. Each eye now affected by his quirk, he opens them. The red dot at the center of the cracked web is not to be mistaken for something stuck. It's what weaves. It's the arachnid's bite. Look into my eyes and tell me they look like a hero's. The unblinking void stares into the souls of Shinso and Todoroki. Blood red tendrils sprout from the small of the ghoul's back, its predatory organ dancing in a hypnotizing display. Suddenly, Akatani appears much bigger than his actual size. My quirk makes me a killing machine. His growl is as intimidating as his presence at that moment. For a second, a murderous bloodlust oozes through. Feeling Eri tremble in his arms, Akatani comes to his senses rather than the ghouls. He snaps out of his self-imposed trance, seeing the petrified one he's put his friends and the little girl in. Immediately, the tentacles retract. He closes his eyes, shutting them as tight as he can, making them go back to normal. And he whimpers a lie to make them feel better that he wishes he could believe as well, I mean. I could be one. When Akatani reopens his eyes, he sees how pale Shinso looks. Shit, Mikumo. I didn't think you could be so scary, 
Whatever breath he'd been holding also releases a slur of uttered words that he only realizes can be taken as offensive after they've already been said. Ah. No offense. Eri puffs up her cheeks in more than a pout as she tries to defend her brother, it's meant to scare the bad guys. Akatani rubs soothing circles into her back as he tries to calm her down, it's okay. I know it's unsightly. He then returns his attention towards Shinso. The other boy is about to say something, but Akatani cuts him off with an attempt to change the subject, please don't curse in front of Eri though. Shinso shuts his mouth and nods instead. However, Todoroki isn't ready to drop the subject matter of Akatani's quirk just yet. I thought you said your quirk forces you to drink coffee. He doesn't have an accusatory tone but he does have a skeptical stare. Shinso's face scrunches up in a mixture of confusion and disbelief. Coffee. Ah, I did say that too, didn't I? Akatani chuckles nervously. Unbeknownst to them, that's the part of his quirk that he's most wary of sharing. For obvious reasons. So he settles for a half-truth as his explanation, um. For some reason, my quirk makes my taste buds different. I can't really eat food. But coffee is fine, Shinso's deadpan doesn't match his raised brow. Why yeah, Akatani swallows whatever lie he could come up with as an excuse since he can't think of anything that'd cover up the fact that it tastes close enough to blood. For some reason, he trails off again in hopes that they'll just drop it. Shinso seems to be accepting of the answer, relatable, giving a non-committable shrug. Todoroki on the other hand, not really. It's a bit strange. How can you be so blunt? Shinso shouts incredulously over the other boy's stoic mannerism, losing his own. The mood changed significantly, Akatani allows himself to laugh at their antics. Well, regardless, I'll admit that it felt good to get off my chest, he feels Eri cradled against it and returns her warm hug with one of his own, you all didn't judge me as harshly as I was expecting. Todoroki hums in mutual understanding from having shared his personal story while Shinso turns away from them to hide his embarrassment over having similar feelings. Whatever, the insomniac tries to play it off like no big deal with a wave over his shoulder, I've got to get going now anyways. He walks slowly but surely towards the exit, see you around. Bye. Shinso, Akatani says on behalf of the trio that's made up of himself, Eri, and Todoroki. He then realizes the little girl in his arms is starting to get tired, Eri and I should probably head home too anyways. Unable to shake hands or bow with his sister occupying his arms, he flashes a smile instead. Thanks for coming, Todoroki. I know we just met, but I feel like we're already close friends. Of all things that could have taken Todoroki by surprise that day, it's hearing that which makes his heterochromic eyes widen. Friends. He tests the word on his tongue with a hesitance like it's foreign. After a moment of contemplating what that means, he asks, does that mean we should do this again? Akatani laughs again, if you want, mistaking the question as a request to continue attending support meetings. I'll bring Eri here again for sure, but you can also always come by Anteiku during my shift but he just so happens to be the embodiment of friendliness, fortunately for Todoroki. Taking that as an invitation, Todoroki nods. Okay, he hesitates before testing the unfamiliar word again. Friend. Yeah. See ya later, Todoroki. Akatani picks up on the unusual usage of the word that time. Rather than make it any weirder or awkward though, he teases Todoroki by tagging on at the end, fellow friend. Todoroki smiles as he watches the receding form of Akatani carrying Eri. The girl in the boy's arms with white hair reminds him of his siblings, making him pull out his cell phone to call his own sister. He waits for a few rings, hoping that she'll answer. Ironically, now that summer has ended, it's gotten warmer out. The sun shines down on Akatani and Eri as they stroll along the sidewalk. Birds sing melodies of hope and the wind blows so gently that not a leaf falls. For once, the two find peace and tranquility. Akatani is accustomed to this calm before the storm, but this time, he feels like it's truly as good as it's going to get. A cartony, Eri's muffled mumble comes from where she has her face nuzzled into the boy's chest. If not for his quirk heightening his hearing and other senses, Akatani would have not heard her. He looks at the tiny girl in his arms, reining in a laugh at how she looks like a baby ostrich burying its head in the sand. Switching her from one arm to the other so that the one he's been holding her with can get a break, he responds, yes, Eri. Am I, 
Her soft voice starts to ask something but it trails off before she can finish. After a short pause, her face comes out of hiding to speak more clearly. Is my quirk villainous? She's still as quiet as a mouse but Akatani hears her anyways. Eri's question makes the boy stop in his tracks, his heart throbbing for her. Oh, Eri. He pulls her back into a hug in an attempt to comfort her, I don't know what your quirk is, but I can guarantee you that it's anything other than villainous. Hoping to cheer her up, he boops her on the tiny horn that sprouts from her forehead, it gave you this cute horn after all. Eri giggles at the affection, her spirit successfully brightened. You're like a tiny unicorn, he laughs along. Eri's smile slackens when she gets a good look at the boy holding her though. She takes in his appearance, noting the effects of his quirk aren't present. But what about you? She innocently asks, you have tails and eyes but you say those are bad. Akatani's smile softens as well, no words able to come out of it to help her understand why they're so different. It's a little more complicated than that, he says instead. After ruffling her silky white hair, he proceeds to carry her down the sidewalk again. Don't worry about it. His emerald eye glimmers when it meets Eri's red ones. Like you said, my quirk keeps you safe, so it can't be all that bad. Eri nods in agreement before resting her head against the chest that she's been using as a pillow. You're my hero, Akatani. If he weren't worried about dropping her, Akatani would break down in hysterics. He can feel the tears tugging at the corners of his eyes like the strings connected to his heart. Maybe in another life, he would have allowed himself to collapse under the emotional wave. Rather than falling to his knees and crying though, he keeps his legs moving and his gaze on the girl who called him a hero. Thanks, Eri. His voice is damp even after he swallows some saliva in an attempt to dry it, I'm glad that I could be someone's. With her face buried, she can't see how seriously her earlier words affected him. So she gives no preamble to what she says next. Can I have a candy apple? Her childish question catches the boy completely off guard. Unable to contain his laughter over how sudden and random, but Sir Eri like that request is, he has to hold her closer not to drop her while shaking from a giggle fit. Were you just trying to get on my good side for a candy apple? He teases. No. Eri's stomach guiltily grumbles as she tries to deny his claim. Laughing still, but taking her hunger seriously, Akatani turns at the next corner. All right, we can swing by the shop for one. He's sure the girl is just as grateful as he is that Anteiku isn't far from where they are now. Feeling her stir, rekindling energy that wasn't there before, he can sense her anticipation of the sugary sweet. Just one though, he has to remind her not to splurge. It's one of those occasions where he really does feel the responsibility of an older brother. He's become accustomed to bringing Eri along with him to Anteiku. The store owner, Yoshimura, has two. He's welcomed the girl with open arms, offering pastries on the house at times. In a sense, he's like her surrogate uncle or grandfather. Akatani's smile slips and falls from his face when he sees who's waiting for him there instead though. A tall and slender man in an unkempt state stands outside the coffee shop, hands in the pockets of a baggy black outfit. The attire is strange enough, equipped with a utility belt and some kind of specialized scarf, that he could pose a problem. Just who I wanted to see and that greeting does nothing to Ale Akatani's concerns. The scruffy man turns to face them, but doesn't move just yet. Ah, oh, I'm sorry, sir. We're closed. Akatani tries to handle the situation diplomatically first. However, he also sets Eri down just in case he needs his hands free. He makes sure to do so in a way that won't risk her being put in danger, placing her protectively behind him. The man notices the way the boy is guarding the younger girl before sighing in exasperation. He acts as though he can't be bothered to deal with the judgment. Yet, he does anyways. Reaching into one of the pouches on his utility belt, he flashes his hero license for the boy to see he's not a threat, you can't make an exception for an underground hero. As much as Akatani is wowed by the reveal of the man's idini, he's admittedly just as scared. Why you're a razorhead? He recognizes the underground hero now that he's able to make the connection. A razorhead's quirk is one that can render Akatani's own useless, no matter how powerful it is. He's one of the few heroes other than All Might that Akatani is fairly certain would be able to catch him. You know me, a razorhead furrows his brows over a mere teenager recognizing him. Underground heroes purposely avoid attracting attention, so it's a wonder of its own how the boy knows him. 
Akatani swallows hard, not knowing how to respond at first. He eventually settles on, um, yeah, I used to be a big hero nerd. Hmm, used to be, a razorhead snorts in mild amusement before shaking his head in lingering disbelief, just don't expect an autograph, kid. Akatani jumps a little, being skittish and hearing such a suggestion too much for him to handle. Oh oh, that's okay, I don't need one, he forces out a pitiful laugh while trying to wave away the very implication that he'd want a signature. Remembering the original reason why he ran into the underground hero in the first place, he moves to unlock the door to Anteiku. Oh, yeah, um, you wanted to come in, he nervously glances over his shoulder while sliding the key in. Just for a bit, a razorhead nods in affirmation. When Akatani holds the door open for him, he steps through the entrance and then slinks over to a booth, thank you. Closing the door behind him and relocking it to avoid getting any other unexpected customers, Akatani asks, D did you want anything in particular? Getting comfortable in the vinyl of the booth, a razorhead rests his eyes for a moment by closing them. Just a coffee to go, please. Black. He then absentmindedly places his order. That makes sense. Akatani nods as he turns on the coffee machine. While that begins brewing, he opens the display case to get area caramel apple. An underground hero like yourself probably operates mostly at night. The little girl holds her hands out to take the candy apple once he places it on a plate. Here, Eri, you can go sit and I'll join you soon. He hands the dish to her with one hand while gently pushing her towards a razorhead with the other. A razorhead reopens his eyes to see Eri warily looking back at him. After some further coaxing from Akatani, she musters the courage to sit across from him. Is this your sister? The underground hero asks. Oh, um, yeah. That's Eri. Akatani realizes that he hasn't quite introduced her or himself yet. Before he can give his own name though, the brewer beeps to let him know it's ready. He returns to preparing a razorhead's coffee without saying more. Having a private moment with the little girl, a razorhead takes it upon himself to try and not seem so intimidating. Hello, Eri. He hunches a little and awkwardly waves while introducing himself, I'm Shota Aizawa. You can call me whichever you'd like. Considering his face is covered in stubble and his shoulder-length hair hangs over the rest, the underground hero doesn't entirely succeed at making himself less imposing. Yet, Eri strangely isn't as afraid as she normally would have been. Perhaps she's coming out of her comfort zone ever since meeting Shinso, Todoroki, and Toga. Or maybe she's just seen scarier that same day when Akatani used his quirk. H hello Aizawa. Eri doesn't quite get the pronunciation right with a mouthful of candy apple but she tries returning the greeting with a polite one of her own. Aizawa blows air through his nose, the closest to a laugh as he'll allow. He then returns his attention to the off-duty barista that he's roped into working unpaid overtime, you two don't look related. Akatani almost spills the coffee that he's stirring, not having put a lid on the styrofoam to go cup just yet. Oh, W well, he searches for an excuse but is forced to surrender when he comes up empty, that's because we're not. Once the lid pops on, he carries the coffee over in order to join them in the booth. She's my adoptive sister, he says despite not having the proper paperwork. I see. Aizawa takes the coffee from Akatani but doesn't drink from it. Instead, he places the cup aside. Kid. He sighs as he prepares to say something else. Akatani tenses, anticipating nothing good. A moment passes where neither of them speak. Noticing the change in the boy's demeanor, Aizawa regrabs the coffee, I never got your name, and takes a sip from it to calm the atmosphere. Oh. Akatani shoots straight to sit upright upon remembering a second time that he hasn't introduced himself, it's Akatani Mikumo. He recovers afterward and tries to find an excuse while apologizing, sorry for not saying so sooner. I was just a bit starstruck, I guess. Aizawa hums, having a mouthful of coffee, before swallowing it down. Are you sure you weren't just surprised to see me, he asks. Akatani chuckles while nodding in agreement, yeah, that too. Aizawa doesn't share in the boy's amusement though. He's transfixed on the coffee cup in his hand, not quite meeting Akatani's gaze. Contemplatively tapping his pointer finger on the styrofoam, he still hasn't said what it is he actually wants to say. I'm going to be honest with you, Mikumo, his tone turns serious when he finally does meet the boy's eye, I didn't come here for the coffee. Akatani fights back the reflex to flinch, 
trying not to show any signs of his internal panic. He's not as good at keeping the worry out of his voice though, wh what did you come here for, the habit of stumbling over his words rearing its ugly head. Aizawa keeps his gaze forward as he says, look out the window to your right, making Akatani curious as to what it is he's supposed to see if he does. There seems to be nothing out of the ordinary when the boy turns his head to take a peek. Not until Aizawa gives him more specific instructions, between the fire hydrant and the stop sign. Akatani sees through the tinted windshield of a parked car, a man in an overcoat and another with a head of fur behind the dashboard staring back. WH who are they, he tears his gaze away from the window and returns it to the underground hero. Aizawa's answer sends shivers down Akatani's spine, one's an undercover officer and the other is a detective. The ceiling fan is off and none of the windows are open. The chill comes from a cold sweat. WH why are they watching us, he hopes to sound oblivious but he already knows the answer. Having finished her candy apple, Eri started listening in on the conversation. She too wears an expression of worry when Akatani asks, why are you telling me this? Aizawa sighs, not fooled by the act of ignorance. Shifting from a comfortable slouch, the underground fixes his posture to be one of preparation. I don't want you to do something stupid like trying to run away. Akatani allows himself to flinch that time. He had been planning on trying to escape as soon as he realized they found him. However, Aizawa has a fair point why that'd be a bad idea when he explains the reason why he pointed out the police, you're surrounded, Mikumo. Getting scared by the tension separated only by a table between them and the hero, Eri leans into her guardian for protection. Use your quirk, a cartony, she whispers into the shirt that she clings to. Her fistfuls of fabric make the boy acutely aware of the position she's placed in by being so close to him. Hearing Eri's desperate plea and seeing their sibling-like display of affection, Aizawa is quick to act. Before Akatani's can, the underground hero's eyes flare red. The harsh glow radiates the room, casting a shadow of the man's hair raising over his head. Don't use your quirk, a razorhead warns. Akatani swallows, knowing he doesn't have much of a choice. The underground hero's erasure has the boy feeling powerless. It's a feeling he barely remembers from his previous life. Quote dot dot. Why are you doing this? He helplessly hopes he can persuade the man to let them go now that he can no longer fight his way out. Why did you do what you did? Aizawa counters. His glowing glare hardens, unwavering, as he corrects himself. Why do you do what you still do? The question sends another shudder through Akatani. Realizing he hasn't been accused of a specific crime yet, he asks, what is it that you think I did? Not diverting his attention from Akatani the entire time, Aizawa reaches into the back pouch of his belt. While the underground hero's sight stays the same, the boy looks down at the table when a familiar mask is placed there. It's what I know you did, Mikumo, the burlap sack that once belonged to Soramitsu Tabe of the Yakuza mocks Akatani with a schooled smile. Akatani places a palm against his face, covering his previously exposed eye. In the darkness, he sees the spacious void of his mind. As vast as it is, it's filled with panic. You're the Tokyo ghoul, Aizawa calls that headspace what it is. It's only when he asks, aren't you, that Akatani pulls himself out from it. Akatani lowers his hand, emerald eye looking into the red of Aizawa's. Why didn't you or some other hero take me in by surprise instead of doing? Whatever this is, he wonders which would have been a crueler punishment. He wonders which of the two he deserves more. Akatani startles when Aizawa's hair suddenly falls. A razorhead just deactivated his quirk. The red glow has vanished, replaced by something more sympathetic. I wanted to give you the benefit of the doubt, he says with sincerity. The underground hero pulls out a tiny bottle of eye drops before applying them. Can you confirm something for me? Mikumo, and doesn't wait for Akatani to answer before continuing, you have no other choice but to eat human flesh. Am I correct? Akatani blinks back his surprise as he asks, how did you know? I've been tracking you for a while now, Aizawa pockets his eye drops before jumping into the explanation, when you first started, it was only once every few weeks. Then you tried blood from a blood bank. If you could get by with just that, then you wouldn't have reverted to your old ways. Realizing the underground hero is referring to the Shihasaikai, Akatani leans back into the vinyl of his side of the booth with a sigh. I only went after the Yakuza because of what they were doing to Eri, he grumbles his defensive reason loud enough for a razorhead to hear. 
Aizawa raises a brow, you have no remorse for what you did to them. None. Both of the man's eyebrows furrow when he hears the boy's answer. Aizawa mimics Akatani's earlier movement, sinking into his side of the booth with a sigh. You're quite the problem child. He glances out the window towards his backup before returning his stare to the boy. Noticing the glance, Akatani asks, what are you going to do to me? He shoots a ghoulish glare as he guesses, put me in a cage. Hearing that her brother could possibly be locked up like she was, Eri springs out of his arms to shout across the table. No, don't do it, Isoa, her pleas startle Akatani more than Isawa though. The underground hero keeps his composure as he gauges the pair. After a moment of silence where each side considers what the other may be thinking, he shifts to speak. Relax, I'm not going to do that, he first assures the little girl. Then returns his attention to the boy, you're not an animal to be locked up. You're just a kid. Akatani's eyes widen in shock, not expecting to be let off the hook so easily. His guilty conscience disagrees with the hero's verdict. Tell that to the people I've killed. Tell that to who I've eaten. And he's fairly certain that he's not the only one who would be opposed to that judgment. Izawa's sympathetic stare comes with more questions. Did you want to kill them, Mikumo? Would you have done so and devoured them if not for your quirk? Akatani thinks he doesn't deserve such sympathy, already knowing the answer to that first question. He's quiet as he considers lying, but decides to tell the truth. I wanted to kill the Yakuza. I wanted to kill the criminals and the villains. He admits his bloodlust with a heavy heart. I know that even if my quirk is meant to kill, it doesn't have to be used that way. I just chose to use it that way. Izawa's brows raise, not expecting that from the boy. They lower as he reevaluates the situation, trying to come to the right conclusion based on the confession, but only because you needed them for consumption. No, Akatani shakes his head, I did it because I liked it. Izawa glances out the window again, reminding himself and the boy of the not as equally considerate law enforcement waiting to take him in. Damn it, kid, I'm trying to help you, the underground hero hisses in a hushed tone. But Akatani just shakes his head again, a somber smile on his face. Sorry, a razor head. There's no helping me. He looks at his hands knowing there's already been plenty of blood spilled on them. I do get these animalistic urges. A desire. They clench into fists as his frustration with himself leaks out. In the beginning, I tried not to give in. After a while though, I got used to seeing the blood. I liked it. He knows he has an instinct that he can't resist sometimes, part of me enjoys it. Izawa looks at the coffee cup in his hand, feeling the warmth it radiates. He imagines no longer being able to taste that kind of satisfaction. He would have to find a new enjoyment. That's what the boy had done with what he was given. If I could erase your quirk so that you could eat a regular meal again. Would you still be saying that? So he tries giving the boy something else to use as an alternative. Akatani's mouth hangs open in awe, nothing coming out of it while he's at a loss for words. When he finally finds them, he's still in a state of shock. You can do that, he wonders. Izawa nods, fairly certain that he can. Akatani looks at Eri and the empty plate in front of her. To taste something sweet again. To enjoy an apple as much as she does. Do you mind? He has to ask if he really deserves that opportunity. He thinks of all the meals he would like to eat again and wonders if he actually can, I would like to make katsudan, but. Izawa waves away those concerns with a small stroke of his hand, take all the time that you need. Nobody will make a move unless I give them a signal, alleviating the boy's worries by a significant margin. Akatani feels the hero's eyes on him when he begins preparing the food. He knows the man's quirk isn't active yet, but his mouth is already watering at the mere prospect of eating a normal meal again. When he seasons pork chops with salt and pepper, he's not that revolted by the smell of meat that isn't human flesh. When he beats an egg and coats the meat with a light dust of flour, he's looking forward to the taste and not worried about spitting it back out. He dips the pork in the egg and covers it with breadcrumbs. The yellow drizzle reminds him of blood spilling, his taste buds tingling. Akatani closes his eyes, trying to forget that last part. When the katsudan is finally finished, he sets the table with a plate for everyone. I, I made extra, it didn't feel right making something to eat by himself. Eri takes her utensils and digs in without complaint at least. Izawa just sticks to drinking his coffee. 
Sitting down to join him, Akatani isn't as hasty to take a bite. It's been so long. The last time he tried to eat something other than human flesh, he puked before becoming bedridden for days. He cautiously takes a fork and knife in each hand, as though they might stab him for trying to use utensils instead of grabbing handfuls of the meat like the animal he's become. When Akatani glances up at Aizawa, the underground hero nods. A razorhead's quirk takes effect. The boy cuts himself a piece before sticking it with his fork. The bit of breaded pork chop is small, but he's still wary about putting it in his mouth. When he finally does, his emerald eyes begin to water as much as his taste buds. He's suddenly the crybaby kid under four again. Izuku Midoriya, for that short moment, gets to eat Katsudan again. Kid. Aizawa's voice is full of concern when he sees the boy breaking like a dam, are you okay? Akatani, Eri stops eating her own food to wrap him in a hug once she sees he's crying. Not wanting to worry either of them, he wipes his eyes with his sleeves. I'm sorry, he apologizes through sobs with a wobbly voice, I just forgot how good it was. Problem child, Aizawa says with a relieved smile. He leans back with a sigh before asking, would you like to eat more? Yes, Akatani shouts a little too eagerly. Realizing he was too loud with his hasty response, he settles back into his seat with a more reserved response, I I mean, yes, please. He doesn't try hiding his bashful blush as he starts scooping more into his mouth. Just take it slow with small bites. Aizawa advises as he watches the boy eat like he's never had a meal in his life. In a sense, that may as well be the case, he figures. MMMHMM, Akatani makes a noise in response as he shoves more katsudan into his mouth. At this moment, the boy looks nothing like a ghoul. He looks just like a kid his age. Aizawa lets the teen enjoy his food for a while longer. He waits before ruining it by continuing their prior conversation, we can continue doing this. I wouldn't mind. We can see if it'll satisfy your hunger and keep doing it so long as it works. Reminded of the offer but also how he got to this point, Akatani pauses before taking his next bite. Th thank you, but, he stares down at the food that had been otherwise foreign to him. I'm offering you an alternative that only I can give. The detective I pointed out won't be so lenient if you decline my offer. Aizawa interrupts before the boy can talk himself out of the proposal. Akatani drops his fork, looking up at the underground hero. So, an ultimatum. Stop hunting criminals for food and you'll let me be free. He's once again taken back by the amount of mercy he's being given. Stop being the ghoul and you can live a somewhat normal life again. Aizawa nods. However, he knows deep down that even he won't be able to convince Naomasa to let it end there. He doesn't want to mislead the boy and lose his trust, so he ventures a little in the territory of what other punishments lay in wait, of course, it won't be so straightforward. You'll have to atone for what you've done somehow and I'll need to meet with your parents. My parents are gone, Akatani abruptly interrupts. He avoids making eye contact when the underground hero frowns. Define gone, a razorhead deactivates his quirk as he sits up straight. I. The boy hesitates before saying, Akatani Mikumo isn't my real name. He doesn't lift his head just yet, still trying not to meet anyone's eyes. Including Eris who tilts her head in confusion upon hearing his confession. Aizawa on the other hand, isn't surprised. I'm aware. Aside from your job here and the apartment that you're renting, Akatani Mikumo doesn't exist. He keeps his gaze on the boy despite his quirk no longer being in effect. He watches for a reaction that doesn't come. Akatani isn't that shocked that a razorhead figured out his name is just an alias. After all, part of an underground hero's job is gathering information. If I tell you stuff, will you agree not to look into my past anymore? He asks instead of what else the man knows about him. Aizawa shakes his head before grabbing his coffee cup. I can't promise that. Sorry, kid. And taking a sip. At least you're being honest. Akatani mumbles before finally lifting his head to meet Aizawa's gaze. He opens his mouth, closes it, reopens it, and then closes it again. Unable to look the hero in the eyes, he looks at the katsudan in front of him instead. I first discovered my quirk when I, the katsudan makes him sick when it reminds him of that night long ago, I ate my mom. Christ. Aizawa nearly burns his tongue. He sets the coffee cup down as he takes that information in. He's almost too hesitant to ask, and your father. Akatani shrugs, unable to give a verbal response. 
Aizawa knows better than to pry any more than that, so he just sighs instead. While treading sensitive subjects, he may as well broach the next one. I can't let you raise Eri alone when you're still a child yourself. He figures it's a good segue from the topic of parents at least. You're going to take her away from me. Akatani's head shoots up in disbelief. No, don't make me leave Akata ni. Don't. Eri takes it worse. She clings to him like he's her lifeline, inseparable if anyone were to try and take her. Aizawa feels his heart throb. He suddenly wishes he hadn't said anything. Then again, he knows it wouldn't have been any better to leave that part to Naomasa. I'm sorry, there's nothing that can be done, is all he can manage to offer as condolence. There must be. Please, you don't understand. Akatani shakes his head in denial as he returns the little girl's hug. His hold can't be too tight since it'll hurt her but he desperately pulls her close. He treats her like a fragile treasure that's being threatened. You're asking me to make a lot of exceptions, some of which I may be able to manage, but this most certainly isn't one of them. Izawa hangs his head in a small bow meant to be taken as an apology for causing them so much hurt, I can only do so much. No, 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 Eri cries. Akatani runs a hand through her hair in a futile attempt to calm her. As he does so, he wonders if that'll be the last time he'll ever be able to touch her. I really don't have a choice. Do I? He's starting to accept the reality of the situation. No. Sorry, kid. Aizawa tries to sound as soothing as possible while explaining, it's either this or you get taken to, which would mean not seeing her anymore anyways. Akatani nods, understanding that logic. He then looks back down at the girl wrapped in his arms. He takes a good look at her just in case it's his last. Will I at least be able to visit her? He hopes that it isn't. Maybe. Aizawa doesn't sugarcoat his uncertainty. I can try to arrange that, but he does offer them an ounce of hope if that'll help to ease their pain. Akatani blinks back the tears that threaten to spill before asking, who? Who would she be going to live with? She'd most likely be taken by an orphanage or some similar form of foster care, Aizawa answers. Not content with that turnout, the boy lifts his head up to look Aizawa in the eye, can I? Can I ask you one last thing? Aizawa sees how tired the boy is from the way his skin sinks under his eyes, the weary stare in him glazed over. Sure, kid. He returns the gaze with a similar one before asking, what is it? Akatani swallows, trying to think of the right words to say. I can tell you're a good guy. He knows from the sincerity that shines when the hero's eyes aren't glowing red. So, can you take Eri as her guardian? He sees the hero react with much anticipated shock, hurrying to justify his request with, I would feel better knowing she's with someone that I can trust. Kid. Aizawa trails off as he tries to think of how he can persuade the boy into changing his mind, I don't know if I'm cut out to be raising a child. Please, a razor head, please. But the boy's green puppy eyes win in the end. No argument would be enough to tell the kid no. Jeez, you really are problematic. How illogical. Aizawa slaps a palm against his forehead where he knows a migraine is bound to form. Fine, I'll do my best, and he starts massaging it to ease the tension before it can become overbearing. Thank you. Akatani smiles in relief. His smile quickly dissipates when he realizes he has to do something harder now. He has to convince the girl he's made his sister. He has to say goodbye, Eri. Eri shakes her head, already knowing he's about to try. No, no. I don't want to go, her grip tightens and she presses into him harder as a form of protest. I know, Eri, I know. He holds her a little more loosely, I don't want you to go either. He knows he can't hold her any tighter for the same reason she has to go. He's too dangerous, but remember how I told you my quirk is villainous. Eri pulls her head back just enough to shout at Akatani without losing her grip, but you saved me with it. You said, and then turns to yell at Aizawa, you're the villain. Not aka ni. Akatani pulls her back, trying to calm her down. Eri, it's not his fault. He shoots Aizawa an apologetic look before looking into Eri's eyes, he's a real hero. He'll be able to take care of you better than I can. But Eri is still in denial, bottom lip quivering. Who's going to keep me safe if you're not there? The tears ebbing at the corners of her eyes start to run down her cheeks. Wanting to stay strong for her, Akatani fights to hold his back. Don't worry, the bad men won't bother you ever again. I made sure of it, 
He tries to sound confident in order to be assuring, and I'll always be around. I'll come see you from time to time. But I wanna stay with Akartani. She presses her face into his chest, tears wetting his shirt. Don't cry, he whimpers while trying not to cry too. This isn't goodbye. I promise I'll see you again. He closes his eyes to prevent them from spilling. But he wants to see her as much as he can in these final moments. P promise, but he can't let this be the last time he sees her either. For Eri's sake, he has to promise her it won't be the last time. Akatani opens his eyes so he can tell her, I promise. That will be all for this video, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and comment down below for more videos, goodbye.